Hi, Brian here with Embrilliance. We're going to take a look at the properties for satin stitches in this video, which is part four, introducing the controls for stitch artist. There are two basic types of satin stitch in Stitch Artist Level 1. There's the satin border and an automatic satin column. The first one we're going to take a look at is the satin border. The satin border has a number of properties, and as we've seen before, they start with the top stitch. Here we have underlay, applique, and tie-offs. We've seen these before in tie-offs, and also applique we just discussed in part three of this series. You might wonder why we have applique as a property for a satin border stitch. And the answer is, we actually have a lot more properties in control in terms of underlay and top stitching with the border stitch. Sometimes you want those controls to be available to your top stitching, but you'd like the ease of access for an applique to be underneath. Let's take a look at what we have for the underlay. Here I've made a low density satin border object. You can see I've made its width eight and its density 9.9, .9, just so that we have something to look at while we take a look at the underlay properties. And the underlay is very important in a satin stitch because as these stitches are created, they're under tension like piano strings. They're always pulling against the fabric. And if you don't stabilize that well or have stitches that are underneath it to hold those stitches out, you will have a constant draw up of the fabric. And we do want to use underlay in a satin, particularly an edge run quite often, because this run along the outer, outer edge of the satin stitch helps hold those needle points out and away. And that's going to mean your satin stitch will lift straight out of the fabric and then come across instead of being nested in the pile of the fabric. And it can also keep registration issues where you have two satin stitches adjacent to each other along this edge. Those needle points could tuck in slightly and grab onto each other's running stitch. So the edge run is very useful. Another common stitch is the parallel stitch. And a parallel stitch, if we turn off the edge run and run the sewing simulator, the parallel stitch basically puts a satin under your satin. And that's going to give you better coverage and more body to the overall stitch. There's also a zigzag version of that, which runs twice as much. So if you have the zigzag on, by definition, it has the parallel on as well. Let's take a look at that. Again, just for adding body or coverage to the satin. Now, it's very common that you'll have both of those on at the same time. You almost always want to run an edge run unless you're doing the satin as a shading or just something that's going to sit in a low density on its own. Now, there's another one which is called freestanding. And the freestanding does a little bit of a fabric weave underneath your satin stitch. And this extra underlay can be used for satins that are going to be applied to cut work or freestanding lace. Let's take a look at that. See, now that we've created a mesh, we could then sew over it with our satin stitch. Normally, with the satins, you will use some combination of underlays. In fact, you could use them all and have yourself a nice Richelieu bar or something that's just going to stand freestanding in space. Now, when we look at the adjustments to these properties, we have the stitch length of two and a half millimeters default, and that's going to be the length of the stitch along this edge run. We also have the inset, and the inset is the distance between the edge run and the stitch points where they land on the outside of the satin stitch. So if we increase that a little bit, you'll see it come in. And if we take it to zero, it sits right at the edge. You want it to inset slightly so that it's pushing against those needle penetrations and holding that stitch. As it comes out of the fabric, it wants to come straight up 
and give you as much width of your satin stitch as you've actually digitized it. And then, of course, density, which would be useful for something like the parallel, and that's going to be how much coverage you have underneath. How much do you have going on behind the scenes? So the underlays for satin, very important, very ne necessary, and often used in combinations of things. And don't be afraid to play around with it, and don't be afraid to add plenty of understitching to your satin. The top stitch here in this letter T that I've brought in using TrueType has a width. The width is the overall width from far left to far right on the stitch. You'll see that in the satin border, as we go to turn, it will add the inclinations for you automatically, and it will short stitch around areas that are tightly turning so that your density stays in a light enough form to be sewable. It won't cluster stitches on top of each other. As we reduce the width, the stitches are actually easier to turn, so sometimes that can be an advantage if you have that opportunity in the art. The density is the distance between stitching. So we can lighten that up or tighten it up. The lower the number, the lower the distance between the stitches, so it's actually a lower number is a higher density. Generally, anything north of four, which is stitch points, four stitch points is four tenths of a millimeter or about half a needle width. Anything in there will do quite well. It's okay, especially if you're using some decent underlay, to increase the uh, the stitch point or decrease the density to somewhere around five or even six because you'll still have reasonable coverage, you'll have fewer stitches, and your design won't gather, pucker, or adjust its registration nearly as much. Now here we have a control for style. Style lets us choose pattern, split, and feather. And to illustrate those, I've created some objects for us. The objects I've made here are basically line objects with different styles associated. This object is a satin border with a pattern with no pattern applied. That is to say, it's a normal satin stitch. This object has a pattern applied. So it's a pattern with the scales pattern. And we can choose different patterns as we go. As we change the pattern, you'll see the decoration on the top stitch changes. Those are just texture effects for where the needle lands. It's going to create a texture in the pattern. We can adjust the length of the stitch, which increases the size of the pattern. And we also have control of the edge pad. If we zoom in and turn off the 3D and turn our stitch points on, I can show you the edge pad is going to be where in the pattern the last needle land occurs next to the edges of the satin stitch. We don't want to have a stitch that's really tight up against the edge of our satin stitch because it could create a fabric lash situation. Let me turn off the underlay in this object as well so that we can illustrate the next property here, which is what happens on the reverse. On the reverse, you'll see that the pattern applies in both directions. And if we change that to none, you'll see that the pattern only applies in one side of the stitch, and on the other side of the stitch, we have a direct stroke. This is very useful, again, because you can have incidental needle lands that happen close to each other, and that can cause fabric lashing where the fabric comes up as the needle comes out of the hole more than once. You also have an anchor stitch. An anchor stitch will put an occasional stitch in at the stitch length, and that is good if you have a really wide stitch and you want to prevent the possibility of any looping. Generally, it's not needed, but it can be handy in the case where we have a satin stitch going one direction, which could be very wide, and we want to anchor in the opposite direction, and what it will give you is a wider satin stitch that doesn't loop as much. So that's a really handy feature to have.
Now, if we take a look at the split stitch, I have one of those right here. The split stitch has a stitch that stops in the middle of each stroke. And when we control the split stitch, we have a number of columns. Let's turn the 3D view back on and change the columns around so you can see how that looks. Two columns means we're going to have one needle land set right down the middle. This is a popular style, and what you'll see sometimes is people will use a running stitch or a decorative motif like candle wicks right down the middle of a satin border this way. This has a minimum stitch property, which means that if we're tapering the stitch, which we'll get to in a minute, we can make sure that we don't have stitches that pile up on top of each other. And for the same reason, this has the reverse stitch control as well. The other property that we have on a satin border is the feather stitch. That's the third style. And here you'll see we've created one and we've feathered it out. And that's a random edge that runs along the satin stitch. And it's used usually to decorate something. It's usually used on top of something else. And what we can do is control how much in and out the random feathering goes. So here we've really pushed the feathering out a lot. Or we could take that down to zero and feather in by some percentage toward the middle if we want. And we have control of left and right independently. So those are your basic styles, pattern, split, and feather. This next piece that I've created is a basic satin border, and I've clicked points along to create a spiral shape. Spirals are a universally useful graphic, and they can be used to fill areas when you're not quite sure what you want to embroider in a certain spot, but you know that it needs just something there. So I've made this spiral to illustrate one more property, which is the line and nib styles. We've looked at this briefly in some other videos. Let me walk you through it again. The line and nib styles have three properties, the line thickness, the nib at the start, and the nib at the end. So here's the start of our shape, which you can see by the green dot. The end is the red dot. And at this end point, we're starting it with a circular or rounded nib. We can change that to a normal, which would be just squared off. And we can go to a pointed, if we want, just for fun. Let's put that back to round. And we'll take the nib at the end and make that pointed because now we're going to take a look at line thicknesses. Now these profiles can be used to change the shape of the line, rather the thickness of the line, over time. So here I can adjust different artistic effects on the shape of the line. And one of the most popular there is number three. So those are the properties for a satin border. And let me just show all on my keyboard. And what did we talk about? We talked about the border. We talked about the underlay. We've covered applique previously. We talked about the pattern and the things that we can do with the various styles of stitching. And we've got the line width and nib styles. All of that's available on a satin border. I think you'll find it's one of the most versatile and useful stitches in your arsenal. Next, we'll take a look at the automatic satin column. The satin column is an extremely useful stitch. And the satin column differs from the satin border in that you can adjust the shape, and it will automatically fill in with satin stitches for you. Now, the way a satin stitch works is there are inclinations, angles, at which the satin stitch is generated. And level one and level two will both generate those automatically, but the big difference going to level two 
is that you have input modes for satin columns and you have complete control over the inclination lines. It's a huge advantage and it sort of separates the casual digitizer who just wants to create a basic design versus somebody who's really focused on getting down to a logo and having a little more precision in their work. Satin columns are probably the workhorse stitch for logo designs. Here we're going to explore the properties of the satin column and most of this you will have already seen so we can get through it pretty quickly. We have our top stitch properties, our underlay which we just covered, it's exactly the same as the satin border and the tie-offs which is the same as the satin border and when we come into the top stitch properties you'll see that we have density just like we did before but instead of having styles we have individual controls for the top stitch including some of our old friends such as the pattern and now instead of an if or either or situation we have both we can add split stitches to it we can also add, if we choose, feathering to it. So we don't have to choose a particular style. We can combine styles in the satin column. This is very useful to have that flexibility. I'm resetting all this to a basic pattern so we can discuss two new things here. And this looks familiar to you, I think, because we've covered this in the fills. This is your compensation. Let's go and add some compensation and we'll zoom in a little. Compensation is necessary when you have registration issues. An object like this one up against another object can create a small gap where the outline is of the shape. And that's because stitches are always under tension and that tension will curl the fabric underneath and pull it in. So what we tend to do is push the stitch out past the outline a little bit so that when the fabric curls up, it's actually being compensated for by having a longer stitch. Remember, stitches are always under tension, and this is why you can't simply start a piece of fabric and then do an embroidery without a stabilizer. You'll always need something there to help hold the fabric flat against the tension of the stitches because that tension is in permanently when you do the embroidery. So compensation is a very useful tool. Another useful tool is gradient and this is really just for a decorative effect. Let's go ahead and apply a gradient. So here we're changing the density over time across the object and we have different ways of doing that so that we can achieve different decorative effects. This is purely for decoration and artistic presence. Quite often you'll do tone on tone or perhaps two layers of a satin stitch with the top one might have a gradient just so that you catch the light a little bit differently or have something going on that's just for artistic merit. So the satin stitch properties between the satin border and the satin column are very similar and the satin column is a little bit more useful and don't forget you can bring in something like a true type uh, piece of art with a satin column and you can break that up it will it will create multiple satin columns for you but the idea in level one is just to be able to use a satin stitch effectively in some basic designs if you're going to logos we really do recommend going to level two because there you'll get to learn about inclination and the inclinations give you a tremendous amount of control. So I hope you understand satins better and the properties and we'll close this video out for now. We'll cover some more stitches in the next video. See you soon.